I'm having some bronchitis and I apologize. I may have to leave the room and, and cough. Um, we've been having a lot of smoke in Asheville this summer from Canada and I think it's affecting me. Mm. Um, well, I, w I wanted to talk a little bit about the hidden and silent aspect of beauty because I think it's something that um, we all feel intuitively as spiritual seekers. And one of the things I've noticed about when I look at images of um, Baba's house and his tomb and the places that he goes <clears throat> when he's photographed with people, I, I've noticed that there is a certain beauty that exudes from all of those places, even in their sometimes really profound simplicity. And even, you know, you, I think a lot of people would look at some of the photographs of um, Mirabad and Mirzad and say it's almost impoverished, but I think we just see beauty in it. Mm -hmm. I hope that people who who look at them who've never been there before um, are able to see the beauty of that, the simplicity of the beauty and the, the beauty of the simplicity. And um, so it's something that is on my mind because I, I know I grew up in an environment where I was told, you know, that you're supposed to dress a certain way and look a certain way and own a certain car and, and that sort of thing. And I really rejected it out of hand because it all felt manipulative. And one day I realized that beauty is actually a spiritual quality or that it can be, and that it can be a very uplifting one and one that can be very transformative because it really goes beyond words and it goes beyond form because it's really an it's really a quality or an energy that pervades something. And we all know that those moments when we meet someone who by regular standards might not be considered beautiful, but we have the deep inner experience that we're in the presence of a kind of radiance or a kind of presence. And um, unfortunately, I never met any of the Mondali. I really um, came to Baba later than that. But um, when I see videos of them, I can, or photographs of them, I can really feel that that sense of a pervasive beauty that defies description. So um, I brought some poems along. Um, I tried very hard not just to pull Rumi poems because um, <laughs> I read so much Rumi um, and I managed to do it. I'm so proud of myself. So we're gonna be listening uh, to some of the work of Rilke, who's a German, German speaking Polish poet We'll be hearing some of the work of Goethe, who was um, the father of the Romantic movement in literature in Germany and a scientist. Um, we'll be listening to some Mary Oliver, which we've heard here several times. Um, Telly has inspired me to dig a little bit deeper into um, poetry from the East. And I found this beautiful tiny little pocket book, which I just love the shape of it and the, and the smallness of it. You can tuck it in anything and take it with you. Um, it's cal called The Sound of Water, the Haiku of Basho, um, Busan and Isu. And I have to tell you that um, I've read haiku before, but reading the haiku of Basho, who was considered really the number one uh, Japanese Buddhist haiku poet of all time is really a mood. And um, it has really stayed with me, his works. We're gonna read some of those. Um, and then I, I pulled a, a, a Hafez poem from Daniel Ladinsky. It's from his very early book, um, his very first book, actually. I heard God Laughing, which I, I love this book. I know it's a controversy, Daniel Ladinsky's Hafez translation. So we'll just call them Daniel Ladinsky's poetry because I think in themselves, they're, they're so f fabulous. And then we're going to end with none other than Rumi's The Big Red Book, <laughs> his poems to Shams. So um, I'm going to I'm going to open. This is a really uh, this is a book about beauty. It's the title of it is Beauty. And mm -hmm. I've never been able to make it all the way through this book because literally every page makes you want to stop and spend about an hour thinking about what the author John O'Donoghue has just said about this topic. It's it's he 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 addresses it so beautifully. He was a Catholic priest uh, from Ireland who left the priesthood when it um, when it came out about what was happening in the Catholic Church with children, 
and he was so upset that he left and um, died when he was 52, two weeks before his marriage, his first time being married. And he's left a real legacy behind of really contemplative thinking and, and some with some beautiful language. So I'm going to just, um, I just picked a few a few paragraphs and we can we can talk about them before we go into poetry if you like or we can just carry on the title of this short um, article is called reverence a path to beauty in order to become attentive to beauty we need to, re to rediscover the art of reverence mm -hmm. our world seems to have lost a sense of this we seldom even use the word anymore. I don't think that's true among Bible lovers, though. The notion of reverence is full of riches that we now need desperately. Put simply, it is appropriate that a human being should dwell on this earth with reverence. As children, we became aware of the word reverence as used to describe the way a person is present in prayer when a priest celebrated the mass with a sense of reverence, you sense the depth of his presence to the mystery. Though the church was full of people, he was absorbed in something that could not be seen. Ultimately, reverence is respect for mystery. But it is more than an attitude of mind. Reverence is also physical a dignified attention of body showing that sacred is already here. Reverence is not to be reduced to a social posture. Reverence bestows dignity, and it is only in the light of dignity that the beauty and mystery of a person will become visible. Reverence is not the stiff, pious posture which remains frozen and lacks humor and play. To live with a sense of reverence is not to become a prisoner of dull piety. Playfulness, humor, and even a sense of the anarchist are companions of reverence because they insist on the proper proportions of the human presence in the light of the eternal. Reverence is also the companion of humility. When human hubris intrudes on or manipulates the sacred, the consequence is inevitably humiliation. In contrast, a sense of reverence includes the recognition that one is always in the presence of the sacred. To live with reverence is to live without judgment, prejudice, and the saturation of consumerism. The consumerist heart becomes empty and lonesome because it has squandered reverence. See what I mean about just like reading a page and you want it to stop and, and think about that for an hour. <laughs> I've never made it past like page 23 in this book. I've had it for years. Um, I I um it makes me think what he just said makes me think about um the, the na native culture. You know, there's um something called the Hayoka in it, he's the trickster or the clown. And he makes people laugh during ceremonies. And that's his job is to bring humor um, <laughs> reverent situations. And I've seen I've seen it in real life and it is hilarious. Um, like built, you'll be at a Sundance and people are not allowed to eat or drink during the entire ceremony. They have to wait till nighttime to eat or drink and they're out in, you know, 90 to 95 degree, 100 degree weather, piercing their bodies as an offering. And um, he'll come out with food, he'll come out with water, hold it in front of you and eat it in front of you. <laughs> it's just hilarious the way he does things. And he does everything backwards. So if you're in prayer with uh, a Hayoka in a sweat lodge, for example, he'll say, I hope your relatives are not healthy and uh, I hope you have a bad <laughs> trip home. And it's all just designed to mess with your head a little bit so you don't take it all too seriously. And it's something I really <laughs> love about Baba is that he we all know how playful he was and how much he loved humor and loved games and plays and um and yet he he never he never abandoned what we consider the word reverence so such a beautiful such a beautiful balance are there any thoughts that anyone would like to share about that 
The book is Beauty by John O'Donohue. Yes, he's written several books. He was considered a poet as well as a, as a writer, but um, he's mostly known for his, his poetry, although I honestly think his prose is really the, his best work. And this is all prose work. And he's quite, he's quite famous. And he was very good friends with uh, the poet David White, who lives in America now, who, who's from Ireland, who's uh, very well known and has sort of, I think, carried the torch of John O'Donohue's work into the present. Um, so happy to have David White around. Gracie? Yes. What came to mind, having been a Boy Scout, is the Boy Scout code. And a, boy, a scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. Oh. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. You. Yeah, you're welcome. I did not know that. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, a few, a few, um, few paragraphs, the title of which are Beauty Evokes Dignity. While we can participate in beauty, we can never possess it. If we attempt to own beauty, we corrupt it. Mm -hmm. When soiled or damaged, beauty can turn negative and destructive. It is ultimately a sacred manifestation and should not be trespassed on by our lower hungers. In the presence of beauty, we are called to be gracious and worthy. Beauty makes presence shine. It brings out elegance and dignity and has a confidence and effortlessness that is not labored or forced. This fluency and ease of presence mm -hmm. is ultimately rooted below the surface in sure depths. In a sense, the question of beauty is about a way of looking at things. It is everywhere and everything has beauty. It is merely a matter of discovering it. The most profound statements that, that can be made about something is the statement of it is. Beauty is. The word is, is the most magical word because it is short, inconsequential little word and does not even sound special. Yet the word is, is the greatest hymn to the thereness, to the beingness of things. Love that. Any, any thoughts? Somehow I managed to, to leave, leave out the third piece. Yes, was someone gonna say something? I'm gonna move on to poetry. I, I left out the third piece. I was gonna read the third piece from him, but um, cannot recommend his work more highly. Anything he's written is just fantastic. Tracy, Tracy yeah. I, just, I just took a look. It's it's in the um, Asheville Library catalog. Oh, great, good to know. I think I'll put a hold on it. Yeah, I, su I suspect we have a copy at the um, at the center's library. I would not be surprised at all. Mm -hmm. if we don't have a copy there because it's just it's just so fantastic. So these are some wonderful poems that I'm so happy to share with you. And um, this is a poem we we actually did a whole piece on uh, Renier. Marie Rene Wilka. He was I uh, died um mid mid 1900s. I am too alone in the world and not alone enough to make every minute holy. I am too tiny in this world and not tiny enough just to lie before you like a thing shrewd and secretive. I want my own will and I want simply to be with my will as it goes towards actions and a higher thing that guides us. And in the silent, sometimes hardly moving times, 
when something is coming near. I want to be with those who know secret things or else alone. I want to be a mirror for your whole body and I never want to be blind or to be too old to hold up your heavy and swaying picture. I want to unfold. I don't want to stay folded anywhere because where I am folded there is a lie. I want my grasp of things true before you. I want to describe myself like a painting that I looked at closely for a long time. Like a saying that I finally understood. Like the picture that I use every day. Like the face of my mother. Like a ship that took me safely through the wildest storm of all. And this is a poem we have uh, by someone we have not read, Galway Cannell. Um, he won the Pulitzer Prize years ago. He just passed about 10 years ago. I think his work is fabulous. Um, and it's about St. Francis. We all know he's very dear to Baba. The bud stands for all these things, even those things that don't flower for everything flowers from within a self-blessing. Though sometimes it is necessary to reteach a thing its loveliness, to put hand on its brow of the flower and retell it in words and in touch, it is lovely until it flowers again from within a self-blessing. As St. Francis put his hand on the creased forehead of the sow, told her in words and in touch blessings of the earth on the sow. And she began remembering all down her thick length from the earthen snout all the way through the fodder and slops to the spiritual curl of the tail from the hard smininess spiked out from the spine down through her great broken heart. If anyone wants me to read a poem again, just to say so, I think it's a nice, nice thing to do. Shall I just sort of read them all again? It's nice to hear them again. <laughs> I think it's. Uh, I'd like it's to nice hear that story. one. I'd like to hear the sow one again. Yeah. Saint Francis and the Sow by Galway Canal. The bud stands for all things, even those that don't flower. For everything flowers from within a self blessing. Though sometimes it is necessary to reteach a thing its loveliness, to put a hand on its brow of the flower and retell it in words and in touch it is lovely until it flowers again from within a self blessing. As St. Francis put his hand on the creased forehead of the sow and told her in words and in touch blessings of earth on the sow. And the sow began remembering all down her thick length from the earthen snout all the way through the fodder and slops to the spiritual curl of the tail. From the hard spininess spiked out from the spine down through her great broken heart. That could describe me at the moment. <laughs> My heart is waiting for someone to touch my brow and remind me of those things. <laughs> this is my uh, one of my favorite writers, Johann Goethe, very famous. And um, I remember when I started reading Hafez, I felt like I needed to um, write a write a letter to Johann Goethe, who died in the seventeen hundreds. Um, and say, his name was Johann Goethe. I wanted to write a letter to him and say, John, it's been great. I found someone else. His name is Hafez. Thank you for everything. <laughs> and then I found out that it was Goethe who had Hafez translated into German from Farsi 
um, I think it actually went from Farsi to something else and then German because he believed that Hafez was his twin brother. And I thought, oh, I'm just in love with two brothers. I'm, I'm good. It's <laughs> 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 a very famous poem of, of, of Goethe. It's called The Holy Longing. Tell a wise person or else keep silent. For those who do not understand will mock it right away. I praise what is truly alive, what longs to be burned to death. In the calm waters of the love nights where you were begotten, where you have begotten a strange feeling creeps over you as you watch the silent candle burning. Now, you are no longer caught in the obsession with darkness and the desire for higher lovemaking sweeps you upwards. Distance does not make you falter. Now, arriving in magic, flying and finally insane for the light, you are the butterfly and you are gone. And so long as you have not experienced this, to die and so to grow, you are only a troubled guest on the dark earth. And you'll read it again? Yes. The Holy Longing by Johann Goethe. Tell a wise person or else keep silent. For those who do not understand will mock it right away. I praise what is truly alive, what longs to be burned to death. In the calm waters of the love nights where you were begotten, where you have begotten a strange feeling creeps over you as you watch the silent candle burning. Now, you are no longer caught in the obsession with darkness and a desire for higher lovemaking sweeps you upwards. Distance does not make you falter. Now, arriving in magic, flying and finally insane for the light you are the butterfly and you are gone. And so long as you have not experienced this, to die and so to grow, you are only a troubled guest on the dark earth. You can see why Goethe felt like Hafez was his twin, twin soul. <laughs> And this is a Kabir poem. Never seem to get enough of Kabir, although we don't actually read him that much. Uh, Bhakti poet from India. I talk to my inner lover and I say, why such a rush? We know there is some sort of spirit that loves the birds and the animals and the ants, perhaps the same one that gave radiance to you in your mother's womb. Is it logical you should be walking around entirely orphaned now? The truth is you turned away yourself and decided to go into the dark alone. Now you are tangled up in others and have forgotten what you once knew. This is why everything you do has some unspoken failure in it. Uh, that's a poem for the life we're seeing around us today. All the chaos we're witnessing. It doesn't have a title, but I'll read it again. I talked, so it's by Kabir. This is actually a translation by the great Robert Bly, who um, also translated Hafez and Antonio Machado and several other really fantastic spiritual poets. I talked to my inner lover and I say, why such a rush? We know there is some sort of spirit that loves the birds and the animals and the ants, perhaps the same one that gave radiance to you in your mother's womb. Is it logical you should be walking around entirely orphaned now? The truth is you turned away yourself and decided to go into the dark alone. Now you are tangled up in others and have forgotten what you once knew. That is why everything you do has some unspoken failure in it. And 
Any thoughts? Oh, I left my, 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 I'll be right back. I just left my piece of paper that had the list of the poems on there. The next one is wondrous. You got you had such a good selection, and you always do. But thank you. This is just um, mind blowing and lovely, lovely, lovely. Thank you. I appreciate that feedback. Sometimes, so I I love these poems so much. But sometimes when I share them, you know, I'm really not sure if anybody else really loves them. So thank you for that feedback. That's helpful for me to um to hear. Really helpful, actually. So um, Basho wrote in the style of haiku he was from japan and uh he was in the sixth from the 16th century haiku is three lines uh five seven five 17 syllables altogether and um a lot of people have made derivatives of haiku you know to make different amounts of syllables um but i find this one a lovely form because it's just so simple so I'm not going to, I will read these twice actually, and then I'm, I'll just go from one to the next because they're so short. And this is put out by um, Shambhala Press, by the way, if you're, um, if you're interested in having a, it's so lovely to have a little book like this because you can so easily take it with you when you go someplace and have a companion with you. But for a woodpecker, Tapping at a post, no sound at all in the house. But for a woodpecker tapping at a post, no sound at all in the house. Summer grasses, all that remains of great soldiers' imperial dreams. Summer grasses, all that remain of great soldiers' imperial dreams. Culture's beginnings, rice planting songs from the heart of the country. So here he's referring to a tradition that a lot of cultures have. I know that the Hopis have this and um, Japanese have this, and I'm sure there are other cultures who have it as well, that when they are planting, they, they sing, um, both to sort of while away the the long laborious hours, but also to um, to uh, awaken the plants and to um, have a communion with them, which I really just love. Cultures beginnings, rice planting songs from the heart of the country. Singing, planting rice. Village songs more lovely than famous city poems. Singing and planting rice. Village songs more lovely than famous city poems. Buddha's tiled temples. Roof floats far away in clouds of cherry blossoms. Buddha's tiled temple roof floats far away in clouds of cherry blossoms. I think I'm not going to repeat these. It feels funny to repeat a haiku. I don't know why I'm going to not repeat them. I, they're sort of like these little fleeting moments that you have to kind of catch, it feels like. So I'm going to see if you can catch them. The great blue oak, indifferent to all blossoms, appears more noble. The clouds come and go, providing a rest for all the moon viewers. Chilling autumn rains curtain Mount Fuji, then make it more beautiful to see. With dewdrops dripping, I wish somehow I could wash this perishing world. Which should you like better, hearing them twice or hearing them once?
Ralph is saying twice. You like hearing them twice? Interesting. Almost like I was uh almost like I was dishonoring the poems by reading them twice, but that's good to know that y'all y'all like that better. Yeah, even haikus. They don't stay they only stay sixteen seconds. I know, but that's the beauty of them, isn't it? Also, do you want any of us to read too to give your voice? Yes, does anyone have something they would like to read? Thank you for asking. Sure. Diane, you're going to blow my mind that you have something to read. Sarah blow gave it to me. So I'm going to look really good. Okay, go for it, sister. And, and that's how our marriage rocks. I love it. It's a Mary Oliver. It's called oh. Lyric. I guess what I was getting ready to read. Are you going to read lyrics? No, I was going to read some Mary Oliver poems. Okay, well, let, let me let us start off you off. The loveliness of Paris seems somehow sadly gay. The glory that was Rome is of another day. I've been terribly alone and forgotten in Manhattan. I'm going home to my city by the bay. I left my heart in San Francisco, high on a hill, it calls to me. To be where little cable cars climb, halfway to the stars. The morning fog may chill the air, I don't know. My love waits there in San Francisco. Oh gosh. You know what, these are the words too, I left my heart in San Francisco. I was gonna By say it. And I was going to say that it does not sound like Mary Oliver at all. I kept thinking, yeah. I got to put this up because I don't think it's Mary Oliver. Whoever can edit that so we don't look totally embarrassed. <laughs> it's um, That's hilarious. This is roomy. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. We I don't know what happened to it. At that we, have a, we have a roomy. That is so funny. Hey. I gave it to you and you all right, you can move on from us right now while we find it. Okay. Well, I'm, we're going to close with Rumi, Diane. So look at um, find it, and then we'll um, we'll we'll close with your poem if you like. Okay. Would love that. Yeah. No, that is so funny. I kept thinking, man, that does not sound like Mary Oliver at all. Okay. So this is from my favorite Mary Oliver book, which that poem is not in. Um, it's called <laughs> Volume One, <laughs> New Intellected Poems. I cannot recommend this book more highly. It is just absolutely a treasure trove of poems. You will never get tired of it. It is just one, her really her best poems that she's ever written in her entire life are actually in this collection, which we're not going to read because they're so famous. I think you have probably heard them. But this one is called um, 5 a.m. in the Pine Woods. And this is actually a true story, by the way. I had a chance to meet her and she talked about this poem and said this actually really happened to her. Um, so Mary Oliver lived in Proven Provincetown, Massachusetts, and she lived in a uh, next to a huge uh, national wildlife refuge where she would get up at dawn and walk by herself into that woods and spend hours and sometimes a whole day um, by herself, what she actually would write while she was walking. I, I would fall over if I tried that. Um, but so that is why so much of her work is really about the topic is nature, but you know, she has this wonderful quality of making you think you're talking about a black snake and then suddenly you realize you're actually talking about eternal life. Just she was so brilliant at it. She she died a few years ago. And if you are a Mary Oliver fan, the best interview I've ever heard by her, she 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 did not give interviews very frequently, but there's a really fantastic interview um, that um, Krista Tippett did with her on a podcast called On Being. And you can just Google that and it'll come up. It's, uh, it's quite long and it's fantastic. And it was just after her partner of 30 years had died. And um, she... Um, had just found out she had lung cancer. Mary Oliver found out she had lung cancer a few years after her partner died. And um, this is uh, when she was in remission before she passed. 5 a.m. in the pine woods. I'd seen their hoof prints in the deep needles and knew they ended the long night under the pines, walking like 
two mute and beautiful women towards the deeper woods. So I got up in the dark and went there. They came slowly down the hill and looked at me, sitting under the blue trees. Shyly, they stepped closer and stared from under their thick lashes and even nibbled some damp tassels of weeds. This is not a poem about a dream, though it could be. This is a poem about the world that is ours, or could be. Finally, one of them, I swear it, would have come into my arms, but the other stamped sharp hoof in the pine needles like the tap of sanity. And they went off together through the trees. When I woke, I was alone. I was thinking, so this is how you swim inward. So this is how you flow outward. So this is how you pray. Five a.m. in the pine woods. I'd seen their hoof prints in the deep needles and knew they ended the long night under the pines, walking like two mute and beautiful women towards the deeper woods. So I got up in the dark and I went there. They came slowly down the hill and looked at me, sitting under the blue trees. Shyly, they stepped closer and stared from under their thick lashes and even nibbled some damp tassels of weeds. This is not a poem about a dream, though it could be. This is a poem about the world that is ours, or could be. Finally, one of them, I swear it, would have come into my arms, but the other stamped sharp hoof in the pine needles like the tap of sanity, and they went off together through the trees. When I woke, I was alone and I was thinking, so this is how you swim inward. So this is how you flow outward. So this is how you pray. Splendid, just I awesome. know. I know. Awesome. I know, and these aren't these aren't even her best poems that I'm reading you. They're just mm -hmm. every they're, I've just now I've never read a bad poem by Mary Oliver, even one about San Francisco, Diane. <laughs> this one is called Roses Late Summer. What happens to the leaves after they turn red and golden and fall away? What happens to the singing birds when they can't sing any longer? What happens to their quick wings? Do you think there's any personal heaven for any of us? Do you think anyone, the other side of that darkness will call to us, meaning us? Beyond the trees, the foxes keep teaching their children to live in the valley. So they never seem to vanish. They are always there in the blossoms of light that stand up every morning in the dark sky. And over one more set of hills along the sea, the last roses have opened their factories of sweetness and are giving it back to the world. If I had an, another life, I would want to spend it all on some unstinting happiness. I would be a fox or a tree full of waving branches. I wouldn't mind being a rose in a field full of roses. Fear has not yet occurred to them, nor ambition. Reason they have not yet thought, nor do they ask how long they must be roses, and then what, or any other foolish question. Roses, late summer. What happens to the leaves after they turn red and golden and fall away? What happens to the singing birds when they can't sing any longer? What happens to their quick wings? Do you think there is any personal heaven for any of us? Do you think anyone, the other side of that darkness, will call to us, meaning us? Beyond the trees, the foxes keep teaching their children to live in the valley. 
So they never seem to vanish. They are always there in the blossom of light that stands up every morning in the dark sky. And over one more set of hills along the sea, the last roses have opened to their factories of sweetness and are giving it back to the world. If I had another life, I would want to spend it all on some unstinting happiness. I would be a fox or a tree full of waving branches. I wouldn't mind being a rose in a field full of roses. Fear has not yet occurred to them, nor ambition. Reason they have not yet thought of. Neither do they ask how long they must be roses and then what? or any other foolish question. When I first started writing poetry, I had a dream about a bear that um, caught my gaze at a lake. We were in a lake swimming together and there was a transference of some kind. And I thought if I ever meet a bear and it seems like the right time, I'm gonna stare into the bear's eyes and I'm going to see what happens, which you're really not supposed to do. And uh, four years ago, I was picking mushrooms with my friend from Augusta, Georgia. And she said, what, what should we do if we see a bear? And I said, oh, we're not going to see a bear. And so we're picking mushrooms in Black Mountain, which is close to Asheville, just 15 minute drive away. And suddenly I hear this thrashing noise and I know it's either a deer or a bear. And this young bear comes barreling out of the woods and for some reason I had a feeling that this was my moment so my friend Terry and I were standing there with our little bags of mushrooms over our shoulders you know not blinking an eye not moving a hair because we knew you weren't supposed to move and so we were just standing there looking at the bear and but I I I decided to really lock eyes with the bear and so I did and I thought well this might not go well, so I'll just send as much love to the bear as I possibly can. So I'm sending the bear as much love as I can while I've locked eyes with it. And it's it's sort of doing this. It's totally interested in what's happening. And so it climbs a little tree right behind it and looks over its shoulder and goes, chase me, chase me. And I'm standing there thinking to myself, that bear has no idea how much I want to chase it and go play with it. But of course I was not moving at uh, eyelash. So it comes down and kind of looks at us like, what is wrong with you all? And sniffs the air and makes a little grunting noise. And then he climbs up the tree again and he looks over his shoulder at us, chase me, chase me. And oh, it's so painful not to be able to chase that bear and go play with it. And then he came down and he looked at us like, you all are so boring I didn't expect this <laughs> it, <finally walks off. laughs> it was an amazing experience <clears throat> this is called the black snake when the black snake flashes onto the morning road and the truck could not swerve death that is how it happens now he lies looped and useless as an old bicycle tire. I stop the car and carry him into the bushes. He is as cold and gleaming as a braided whip. He is as beautiful and quiet as a dead brother. I leave him under the leaves and drive on thinking about death. It's suddenness, it's terrible weight, it's certain coming. Yet under reason burns a brighter fire, which the bones have always preferred. It is the story of endless good fortune. It says to the, to the oblivion, not me. It is the light at the center of every cell. It is what sent the snake coiling and flowing forward, happily all spring through the green leaves before he came to the road. When the black snake flashed onto the morning road and the truck could not swerve death, that is how it happens. Now he lies looped and useless as an old bicycle tire. I stop the car and carry him. I stop the car and carry him into the bushes. 
He is as cold and gleaming as a braided whip. He is as beautiful and quiet as a dead brother. I leave him under the leaves and drive on thinking about death. It's suddenness, it's terrible weight, it's certain coming. Yet under reason burns a brighter fire, which the bones have always preferred. It is the story of endless good fortune. It says to oblivion, not me. It is the light at the center of every cell. It is what sent the snake coiling and flowing forward happily all spring through the green leaves before he came to the road. So Dan, would you like to read, are you, if you're there, would you like to read your Rumi poem? We're gonna shift over to Rumi. Yeah, I had to, I'll be honest, any um, talk of the aforementioned animal that you just talked about, yeah. reptile. I, Say, I couldn't hear you, say it again. It's okay. It's okay. Fine. I'm having trouble yeah. hearing you, so I'm thinking other people okay, are I'll talk louder. Okay, thank you, that's okay, helpful. This is not Tony Bennett. <laughs> where my research team has investigated thoroughly. But I will say a Rumi poem to the tune of I Left My Heart in San Francisco. <laughs> Listen, oh beautiful soul. Every day a new feast comes running into your life. Always a new experience. Your body is like a guest house, receiving company from the hidden world. Some are positive, some are tragic, and still others who are frantic, all mirroring your needs, all showing you ways to expand, all challenging your beliefs. Whoever that comes from these unseen lands, receive it without regret. Welcome all that come to you with no judgment. Remember, every visitor here a short time meant only for your peace. Wow. Dan, can you read it again and more loudly? I really had trouble hearing you. Okay. Listen, oh beautiful soul. Every day a new feast comes running into your life. Always a new experience. Your body is like a guest house, receiving company from the hidden world. Some are positive, some are tragic, and still others who are frantic. All mirroring your needs, all showing you ways to expand, all challenging your beliefs. Whoever that comes from these unseen lands, receive it without regret. Welcome all that come to you with no judgment. Remember, every visitor here a short time meant only for your growth. Hmm. Is that called the guest house? No. I know it has the words guest house in it, but it's not. Well, it sounds just like that poem written in other words. Who who translated it? Shar Sharam Shiva. And what's the title of it? It's not there. Uh -huh. But you might be right that I think it's that, guess, I think it's the guest house poem um re re uh, retranslated. Yeah, it shows how different a translator can yeah. make a poem, yeah. yeah? Yes. Because yes. the real famous one is by uh translated by Coleman Barks, which we've all heard several times. Um but that is interesting to hear another translation. Wow, so different. Thank you for reading that. Do you have, do you have any more uh, Tony Bennett poems you can read while you're while you're up? Hey, hey, hey! I am going to remind you of that for the rest of your life. You know what? This has been <laughs> recorded. I don't think you. I think more people are going to remind me of this. I know. I love that. <laughs> 
Okay, we're gonna <laughs> end with a um hang on, why why is this not happening right? 257. You're never you never left. Hmm. Well. Ah, here it is. This is a poem called You You Never Left by Rumi. The Lord of Beauty enters the soul as a man walks into an orchard in spring. Come into me that way. Light the lamp in the eye of Joseph. Cure Jacob's sadness. Though you never left, come and sit down here and ask, why are you so confused? Like a fresh idea in an artist's mind, you fashion things before they come into being. You sweep the floor like the man who keeps the doorway. When you brush a form clean, it becomes what it truly is. You guard your silence perfectly like a water bag that does not leak. You live where Shams lives because your heart was strong enough to take you there. The Lord of beauty enters the soul as a man walks into an orchard in spring. Come into me that way again. Light the lamp in the eye of Joseph. Cure Jacob's sadness. Though you never left, come and sit down here and ask, why are you so confused? Like a fresh idea in an artist's mind, you fashion things before they come into being. You sweep the floor like the man who keeps the doorway. When you brush a form clean, it becomes what it truly is. You guard your silence perfectly like a water bag that does not leak. You live where Shams lives because your heart was strong enough to take you there. Oh, so good. Does anybody else have any poems they'd like to uh, share before we close? Or comments? I know you all, I think most of y'all know this, but this is my very favorite Rumi book and highly recommend it. The Big Red Book. These are all poems written about, specifically about Rumi's relationship with Shams and how it transformed his life. I think beauty is a really important big red book. What, dear? How many poems are in that big red book? bunch <laughs> that's how thick it is and it's all by translated by Coleman Barks yes I'll what, share one I'll share one thank you this is Alice Klein a poet a Berkeley poet oh this is nice can I go ahead yes thank you okay. How he loves you. I read it this morning at RT. How he loves you. He never stops loving you. Imagine that. Never. Did you ever in your life think you could be loved like that? And haven't you longed for that, even though your whole life proved it wasn't possible? All you knew were disappointments, betrayals, incomplete and inconstant love. Love that was off target, like a kiss that slides off your cheek into the air. But he knows you. He has always known you and always loved you. You search everywhere for something. But as soon as you turn in his direction, he claps his hands for joy and comes running. <laughs> hey, Baba. Okay, Baba. It's that is at Sherry R. I looked it up, Betty. Oh, great! Oh, I'm glad to hear that. This is from her book, What the Heart No Wants. Great title. Yeah, she's a good friend of Max Reef. I'm. Sh I would think he would read her poetry 
in his meetings, his readings. Oh. Mm. I'll, I'll look around. Tracy, <clears throat> yes. Tracy, have you um, heard Coleman Barks live? Yes, several times. Mm. He doesn't read anymore because, you know, he's had a stroke and he just doesn't read. He doesn't read anymore at all. He's in his, uh, I think, early 80s. He said several strokes. But yes, I have heard him read. And uh, I told the story. Um, well, I told the story about telling him. I told this funny story about going to see him here in Asheville. And uh, it was winter. And he's sort of got a, you know, little Buddha belly. And he's got these rosy cheeks. And he's got this white beard and this wild white hair. He looks just like Santa Claus. And he's, you know, I met him when I think he was like in his mid sixties. And so I wanted to say something nice to him. I was the last person in line to get my book signed. I just wanted to say something kind and thoughtful and affirmative. And, and I, and, and I, and there was a little twinkle in his eyes, you know, and I said, you know, you just look, you look just like Santa Claus. And I just, and, and he just looked so crestfallen. And I thought, oh my God. <laughs> what have I done? You know, I've just said the absolute wrong thing. And I just felt so <laughs> horrible. So I called Charlie Gardner, who lives in Athens and is friends with Coleman Barks. I said, Charlie, can I, can I download this experience too? Cause I don't understand how he could possibly have been upset by what I said. I was really trying to say something loving and kind He goes, Oh, he, he thinks he's, you know, God's gift to women. You, you totally crushed him. Grace. <laughs> Who is this to? Coleman Barks. He's the primary Rumi translator. <laughs> and God's gift to women? Yeah. 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 Well, I guess it's I I I just I'll just say this. This is not the first time I've heard the story about, you know, poets. <laughs> so it must be in part of the territory of <laughs> poets. Happy to say it's not not true of my life. <laughs> um, then, so this is a really interesting story. Um, I was, uh, some, some of y'all heard the story, but I was having a difficult time several years ago and I, I had the thought, uh, grief, which I was experiencing very profoundly, grief has the power to put me in, in my grave, like kill me, put me in my grave. And I thought, wow, that's just, that's too big of a thought to, to, you know, really dig into right away. I'll just take that one day at a time. So I was trying to contemplate what that meant for me. And Kathy Riley called me uh, two or three days later and she said, you know, Coleman Barks is coming to Asheville. Would you like to go see him? And I, I said, yes. Yeah. So I went to see him read. This was my first time seeing Coleman Barks read. I've now, I guess, seen him four times. And um, he read a poem about grief called Love Dogs, which we've read here several times. It's probably one of his most famous poems of Rumi, one of the most famous translations of Rumi. Um, it's fantastic. Is there anyone here who has not heard that poem, Love Dogs? Um, I've heard it, but I want to hear it again. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll recite it for you because I've memorized it. Um, and when I heard that poem, I realized, oh, no, grief does not have the power to put me in my grave. Uh, grief grief is the, the doorway. And grief is going to be my my the, the, the handle on the door for me. And that has turned out to be um, really true. So I was so, so, so I've, I will eternally be grateful to Coleman Barks um, for his translations. Uh, it took him years and years and years to do it as, as you can imagine, because this is just, this book is just one of several books that he's published of translations of Rumi. And um, he's basically spent, so I, I heard a story that after work every day, he would go to a little coffee shop in Athens and he would write in a diner four hours until dinner and he did it every day for several years and then realized he had a body of work that he could publish and it was Robert Bly who um you know started the men's movement here in the United States who was friends with him that um asked him to uh release Rumi's poems from their cages so he was really <laughs> the person who inspired um Coleman Barks to do that work and I'm so grateful that he did um, because he's really left a legacy behind, just an incredible legacy. Um, so um, here is, uh, here it is. <clears throat> One night a man was crying out, Allah, Allah. His lips grew sweet with the praising until a cynic said, 
So I have heard you crying out, but have you ever heard anything back? The man had no answer for that. He quit praying and fell into a confused sleep. He dreamt he saw an angel, the guide of souls in a thick green foliage. Why did you stop praising? Because I never heard anything back. This grief you are crying out from is the return message. Your pure sadness asking for help is the secret cup. Your longing draws you towards union. Listen as a dog moans for its master. That whining is the connection. There are love dogs no one knows the names of. Give your life to be one of them. Tracy, are you familiar with Betsy Cox, Elizabeth Cox, um, Coleman Barks' sister? She writes novels. No. Um, I had a good friend. Um, I, I'm from Durham and I was living in Durham after college and um, she taught at Duke. Um, and then she, um, she was married to some sort of doctor, but they split. And she left there and she teaches somewhere and she probably is retired by now, but um, Elizabeth Cox. Oh my gosh, that's incredible. That's an incredible story. Thank you. We'll look her up. Um, I've been invited to teach at, uh, to, to not to teach, not to teach, but to recite poetry at um, the school where Coleman Barks grew up in. It's in Chattanooga. His father was the headmaster there. I forget the name of it. Um, Baylord. Baylord in Chattanooga. I'm looking forward to going. That's cool. Yeah, it's a beautiful town. Well, if, unless I have, someone else has something to say, we can close the evening. Thank you all for being here and for being part of this lovely evening. I, I never get tired of listening to good poetry with, with <laughs> friends. It always makes me... Um, Do we have time for another haiku? Yes, dear. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I don't have it. I was going to ask you, Tracy. Oh, to yes. I can select one up from what you were reading. Yeah. In, yeah, whatever you have there. Yeah, there actually is one that's in the preface that I thought was pretty fantastic. Um, well, there are a couple that are pretty fantastic. Um, here's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll grab one or two since they're so nice and short. Uh, so I'm from Augusta, Georgia, where we had lots of camellias growing, growing up, and they were always such a joy for me because I grow in the winter. So mm -hmm. this is a, this is a camellia poem. The camellia tips, the remains of last night's rain splashing out. Slung over a screen, a dress of silk and gauze, the autumn wind. In pale moonlight, the wisteria's scent comes from far away. Pure white plum blossoms slowly begin to turn the color of dawn. <laughs> Clinging to the bell, he dozes so peacefully, this new butterfly.
utter aloneness, another great pleasure in autumn twilight. In a bitter wind, a solitary monk bends to words cut in stone. Uh, there's actually some poems in here that are really, um, what's the word? Um, it's, um, he, he doesn't leave anything out um, in some of these poems, but I'm not reading those ones. The late evening crow of deep autumn longing suddenly cries out. On these southern roads, on shrine or thatched roof, all the same, swallows everywhere. <laughs> um, this is really one of my favorite. How reluctantly the bee emerges from deep within the peony. <laughs> so beautiful. Is this all Basho? Yes, and there are two other poets in this little collection, Isa and Busan, but in the preface, they basically say there is no parallel <laughs> to Basho. And then they say something like, even the, the best um, second and third rate poets in Japan of haiku, Isa and Busan prove our point. Not, so I haven't even read them yet. Actually, I read a few of their poems and I thought, oh yeah, I agree. Uh, he's sort of in a category all his own. The simplicity and the authenticity of his poems, I think, is a little tr tricky to pull off. Um, you know, poetry is really considered sort of the, among writers, poetry is really considered sort of the hallmark of um, writing because um, it's 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 like uh, Japanese calligraphy. If you make one mistake, it's right there, and you can't not see it because it's it's also simple. So I think of haiku as being really sort of a penultimate um, simplicity of poetry because it's either there or it's not there. You know, you can't you can't really fake a haiku. Mm -hmm. in, How do you my, spell basho? It's B A S H O, and this is from Shambhala Press, which has got some. And the translator is Sam H Hamill. Um, I've ordered several books um from amazon and from my, our local bookstore um of um poetry from the east and often the translations are terrible so this was one that did not disappoint uh telly do you have a favorite book of um poems from japan or china because you're you've got such a lovely collection uh no not that i can Okay. put my finger on it yeah sorry i didn't mean to put you on the spot <laughs> <laughs> well thanks everybody for coming so appreciate it oh well thank you Jason. thank yeah. you thank you, thank you. you can do it. just while we're all together i'd like to re kind of re help refresh my own uh, shadowy remembrances of reading Chinese uh, uh, scriptures like the T-A-O Tao Te Ching and mm, yeah, so good other so good and as i recall every uh, every statement has the a quality of you can that of simplicity yeah i would say perhaps akin to haiku or maybe some of it is yeah i mean you know but profound every and i didn't it's been ages since i've I don't know where those books are. So uh, I didn't know if you guys had been keeping up with the the, the Tao or there are there are other works, other things that are similar or if not similar. Yeah. 
Impor important, noteworthy, yeah. very noteworthy. Uh, yeah. You could call them scriptures, I think. Yeah. yeah. I think the Tao Te Ching is so old that they actually don't know when it was written. That's how old it is. Oh, yeah. What about Confucius? He, do you recall Confucius? Have you read Confucius? I, I, um, I'm sure I've read a few quotes by him, but I've never read, and I've never read anything more than a few quotes. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I lived in Japan, um, a long time ago. I lived in a Buddhist monastery, and the thing that I really noticed about um, traditional J Japanese culture, which is not so true about <laughs> non-traditional Japanese culture, is that traditional Japanese culture really, um, it really uh, emphasized simplicity and celebrated it and st strove for simplicity. And yeah. um, I, I I feel like I've, you know, I've been to, you know, London and Rome and Florence and I've seen some, you know, the highlights of um, Western art on the planet. And um, as much as I just, you know, couldn't fathom how beautiful they were, I have to say that I remember very clearly seeing some Japanese art that I, it was so simple and and so sublime in its simplicity that I felt like I, I couldn't, I couldn't really take it in. I couldn't really um, comprehend its greatness in its simplicity. And it was super um, humbling, actually, to witness something like that. Um, yeah. Um, one of my yeah. favorite quotes is by Thomas Jefferson, who said, "Simplicity implies greatness." And I really think there's something to that. Um, and it's one of the things I really love about, you know, I've, since I've never been to India, I look uh -oh. at the house, the houses in his rooms and, um, you know, walking into Baba's house at the center. There's just a simplicity about everything. And for me, it's it's a very, it sort of engenders a, a kind of freedom in, in me to be around that kind of simplicity. You know, the distractions are sort of gone intentionally and i just uh find that very especially for a spiritual life if you're you know in, endeavoring to to live a more spiritual life i find that that kind of life is um like that's what it was like living in that Buddhist monastery it was just complete simplicity like utter complete simplicity um so for example when we would have a meal um we would have whatever they offered us it was usually rice with a few pickles and mm -hmm. that's what we had maybe a little bit of fish and they would put it in our bowl we would eat the food with our chopsticks. Then we would take a, a pickled vegetable. We would pour boiling water into our, our cup that we had just eaten out of. We would clean the bowl with the piece of pickled vegetable. We would then eat the piece of pickled vegetable and we would drink the water done. And you put mm. it back on the top. <laughs> it was incredible. <laughs> It was so incredible. Pickled vegetables. You can, you can yeah. see my office. I'm I'm the opposite of simple. I mean, I have I've not mastered that in any manner, shape, or form. It's hard to say. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I remember one of my jobs as a as a 19 year old um, girl in the Buddhist monastery was um I had to sweep the leaves off of the moss in the garden. Hmm. And it just gave me, you know, such, I just can't even tell you the um, contentment that gave me to do something like that. Mm. And that somebody even wanted me to do something like that, you know, that there was a job for someone to do that. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. One of my other jobs was to take the ashes from the incense on the altars and they had little incense um shaping tools and you use those tools to shape the ashes of the incense into different shapes so that it would be beautiful and then they would put the new incense on top of it it's just incredible hmm. are you taking a gap year or so i actually so <laughs> i was actually um i had actually moved to japan to become a buddhist nun and I didn't tell my parents what I was doing. I, they thought I was just going to go there for a gap year. And because uh, I knew they wouldn't let me go if they thought I wasn't coming back. But while I was there, I had a big epiphany. And the epiphany was I 
that God doesn't make mistakes and that um, if he had wanted me to be born a Japanese Buddhist nun, he would have made me one. And then <laughs> I get my white derriere back to America and um, I needed to work with what was uniquely American that reminded me of the inclusiveness and the groundedness and the spaciousness of Buddhism. And I really came kicking and screaming. I really did not want to come back. But um, I felt that I was had to re receive that. Um, so, I, and then when I was 27, I met um, some, some Hopi elders and I suddenly for the first time in my life realized what I was being asked to do. I was being asked to work with Native people. Mm -hmm. And I, of course, at 19 years old, had absolutely no clue what it meant to say, go find what is uniquely American that reminds you of this experience of Buddhism. I genuinely had absolutely no idea what that was. So mm -hmm. um, so for years I worked with Native people. Mm. And that was uh, that was life changing for me to do that. Mm. Oh. And if you're in Asheville, my exhibit is actually up. Um, Diana, I don't know if I told you, but the Native, my Native American Museum exhibit is at Leaf Global downtown. Where Where did you say it is? It's at a um. It's called at Leaf. You know, Leaf that does big festivals in the spring oh, yeah. and fall. What is, what's, where's the location downtown? It's um, three doors down from Limones, which is um, right across from the YMI Center. Okay. It's where the um, Fine Arts Center is, and it's you walk down that little street um, okay. called Eagle Street, and it's at the very end of Eagle Street. It's called Leaf Global. It's their downtown space with a lovely music space, and they have camps there for kids, and there's an upstairs and a downstairs, and my, they have room for half of the exhibit. So you can see it, my photographs and interviews with Nick. What do you think perhaps sets a date while your exhibition is up and perhaps you and Diane go together? And just with your camera phones, take us for a tour. Oh yeah, I, I actually Maybe. did that. On Zoom, on this venue, on the Baba Zoom. What do you think of that? Does that interest you? I don't, I mean, it always interests me to share share the work I spent. What does everyone else, what do you think, Tally? Yeah. What does anyone Gail, else think? Uh, Betty, <laughs> Diane, Terry, y'all interested? Yes. Would y'all like that? Um, would it have to be on this uh, Thursday? Are you, is this once well, a month? Maybe it wouldn't have be on a Thursday, Last maybe it was, it's always on the first Wednesday of the month. Oh, sorry, Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how long is the uh, the uh display? The uh, how is long it, is your the exhibition? How long is it posted? It's will it it, hang? It'll be up for another six months. Um, but I it will, it. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um. And if you go to my Facebook, would page, that be difficult? Is it? Is it? Or is it tricky? Or can you just no. sort of walk in and do it? And you can have fun. I can. Yeah. I, can I've, I. It's on my Facebook page right this minute. If you. If you are. If you have Facebook, but if you don't, I don't. I mean, I'm if there was an interest, I'd be happy to do it. I. I. I didn't think there would be an interest on Baba Zoom. Like that might be a thought for next month if you feel like if you want. Sure. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll do it. Yeah. Great! Wow. Yeah, yeah, I don't, yeah, cool. There was actually I'd like to see it. Yeah, I'd like to see what you, where you've been, and and hear about your experiences, and see the thick pictures. We can yeah. tie it into uh, Baba's journey from you know the East Coast to the West Coast, following the Trail of Tears, and we can also tie it into an interesting experience I had with um, Mayor Baba asking me to. Um, photograph and interview Eddie Box. Oh, youth. wonderful. Wow. Um, which I didn't want to do. Because oh. I, I figured it was not a good idea to say no to Baba. And um, I'll tell you that story because it's a really fabulous story. Oh, that that's great. Wow. Orchestrated as he does. Oh, Ooh, looking forward to it. That sounds really cool. Thanks good, for good. initiating that. Yeah. Never thought of it. Good suggestion. 
Wow, that's great. Question, Ralph. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. The name of the place that your um photographs are in Asheville. Um, it's called Leaf Global. And it's down on Eagle Street in downtown Asheville. But okay. if you're not coming to Asheville and you would like to see some of the work, I have a website that has several of the pieces uh, on there and you can see them really well and se several of the interviews I did. And it's it's just my name.com, tracyschmidt.com. And um, you can really see the, the work quite well. Um, and um, it's a nice way to engage with it a little bit more slowly than we would be able to do in an hour like because it takes quite a while to go through the exhibit because i i i i interviewed all the people that i photographed and um the interviews are quite extensive and my graphic designer who was an award-winning graphic designer said these interviews are too long you can't put these in a museum exhibit and i said i i just can't edit them down any any more because everything they said it was so fabulous so people can you know read them or not read them, it's up to them. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make them any shorter. So they're very expensive uh, text panels. And mm -hmm. um, I was so grateful to be able to actually move in with some of the elders that I interviewed and um, just really observe them and ask a lot of questions and got to go to some ceremonies with them. And um, it really changed my life to spend time with Native American elders. And, um, Hmm. and how they're they were doing things and how they were making some decisions and um um it's like for example uh the first elder i went to see i was supposed to get there like at 11 o'clock at night but um i was out in nebraska he's a winnebago and i i kept i i was seeing the biggest lightning i've ever seen in my entire life and i just had i just kept stopping and photographing it on the side of the road which was crazy because i could have been killed but there I was with my camera on a tripod photographing lightning in the middle of the night. So I arrived at six in the morning instead of 11 o'clock <laughs> at night. And, um, and they never said, what the heck? You know? <laughs> six in the morning, really? We're okay, how about, we're gonna go to sleep now. We'll see you later. No, they did not say that. They, they were awake. They invited me into their home. They said, are you hungry? Are you, are you thirsty? Um, just sat with me it was so beautiful the experience and um for years I had been wanting to find a um a deer antler for a a staff that I was making and people kept giving me deer antlers and and they and I kept giving them back to them saying oh this deer antler just doesn't I didn't say this deer antler doesn't feel right but I just said oh thank you this isn't quite what I'm looking for and this happened several times to me and so I had been in his house maybe two or three hours and he walks into his bedroom and he gets his deer antler and he hands it to me. And it's just this like museum quality work of art. It has these un unbelievable um, engravings on it. And I'm holding it in my hands. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this deer antler has like amazing energy. And, and, and it was just, it, it was just, it was incredible. And so I said, thank you so much. I, I held it and then I, I looked at it and then I said, thank you so much for showing this to me. And I, I handed it back to him and he goes, oh no, that's for you. I said, I, I said, no, I can't take this. It's, it's too precious of a gift. He goes, well, that's how we native people are. The things we wouldn't sell for a million dollars, but we would give them to the right person. And I knew the minute I met you, this was yours. I've had it for years. I always knew it didn't belong to me. And now it's yours. And it's really one of my most prized possessions. So is it there on display? It's not in your house where you could go Oh no, it's in my home. I would never leave it in a museum. Ever. Never ever. I would never. It's in my home. Can you go get it? Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> I should spotlight her. She can spotlight herself. Uh, wow. I'm gonna go off camera and out on to mute. But enjoying your art talk. Thank you all. <laughs> See how good the light is here. Can you spotlight your yourself, Tracy? Spotlight. I'll spotlight you. I'll spotlight you. Oh, yeah. good. Yeah. Um, I can't. Oh, there I am. Okay, yeah. So here's the. Here it is. And um. 
So you can see at the very base, there's a face of a, a man. Mm -hmm. And then as you go up, it's an eagle, which is my very favorite bird. Wow. I know, it's incredible. Good, the, I don't know if you can see the detail on it. Yeah. And then oh, as you go down to one of the rungs, it's a, it's a horse. Mm -hmm. Ooh. And then as you go down another one of the rungs, it's a uh, medicine wheel. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Mm. And then as you go down another one of the rungs, it's a poisonous snake. It's a rattlesnake, actually. Um, it's pretty... Wow. Um, so who carved it? It was his. It was his nephew, who's who I never met. So I don't know his nephew's name. I, I, I'm sure he told me his nephew's name, but um, I I don't remember. Um, but the man who gave it to me is named Warner Earth, and his photographs are in the exhibit. or several of his photographs in the exhibit, and um, he was um the head of the Native American Church. Which oh, is uniquely Native um, American wing of the of the Christian faith, and it was started actually by um, some uh, some um, Native people in Oklahoma who were you know dealing with uh, pretty severe alcoholism after having been forced under reservations that they did not want to go to by gunpoint, and then their children were taken from them by gunpoint. Oh so of course they were all alcoholics, and. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but um, <clears throat> it was Jimmy Carter who um, passed a law in 1979 called the Freedom of Information Act, and tagged onto that law was a smaller law, which happens in politics, um, apparently, and that was, uh, and it was an allowance, that law that was tagged onto the Freedom of Information Act allowed Native people to freely practice their culture and their religion for the first time since they had been put on reservations. So prior to 1979, the FBI could and did um, go into people's homes, into their kivas, into their sweat lodges, into their sun dances, into their, their ceremonies, whatever kind of ceremony they were doing, and they would destroy the altars and they would take the sacred oh. objects. <sighs> The same wow. way the Chinese did to the Tibetan monks. In, um, mm. So um, so that was a big deal. And so um, in the Native American church, they, use, um, they used peyote um, as a sacrament. And mm -hmm. um, that apparently that peyote um, was part of a larger movement among Native people to step away from alcoholism and back into their culture. And um, Warner Earth said to me that, um, and, and that what he said to me was the exact same thing. Every single, sing, every single elder without exception has said to me, uh, including Eddie Box, um, they have told me that it was returning to their ceremonies and to their cultural ways that they were able to step away from alcoholism by coming back to their culture. It was, it was such a critical thing for them to do. Um, and they were really not able to do that until, you know, um, 1980s. So um, peyote was still was still legal really until the 90s. It was the one facet of Native American culture that remained illegal until the 90s. And Warner Earth, the man that I interviewed, was instrumental in uh, testifying to Congress uh, and getting peyote to be um, made legal for for the purpose of ceremonies. And um, he invited me into that ceremony, um, but I wasn't comfortable going because I don't do drugs. And so I had to explain to him that I knew it was a sacrament to him, but that I um, was uncomfortable taking any kind of drug for any kind of purpose whatsoever. And so I, I said, no, and he was so gracious about it. He was so understanding and just so, he 100% understood why I made that decision. I was terrified when I said that to him that he would be offended, you know, um, but he was not. But he did take me to their ceremonial grounds where he and I um, really felt we were being um, spoken to, 
to to photograph those grounds and so we we did he he let, he invited me to photograph the grounds which was such a great thing because um the grounds are basically an equal uh there are a, a, a heart engraved on the ground and just inscribed with a stick um and it's a heart inside a heart so it's a double heart and then there's equal on the cross inside that and then they would erect a teepee over those grounds. And that was where they would do the peyote ceremony at night. And um, he told me that um, not only did it allow him to work his way out of alcoholism, but that it really brought people, the, 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 the whole tone of peyote, the whole essence of it is, is unity. So he said, when people do it, they feel this incredible unity with each other, which is so beautiful and so necessary for, for native people today. So um, he was the very first elder that I interviewed. And I, I remember he and I were walking down a road one day and, uh, and, uh, and uh, an owl flew in front of us. And I knew that owls were considered um, omens of warning to Native people, even though for me, they're, they've, you know, I've always thought of them as wisdom, sitting on Athena's shoulder. But they're also, even in Athena's time in ancient Greece, they were considered warbirds was partly why it sat on Athena's shoulder. It was a war bird. And so there are birds of death to native people and all, all of the tribes that are considered um, birds of the night, birds of the underground. And so um, he stopped, he said, well, we're going home now. And I knew it was about the owl. And he called several people, like just we walked into the house, he picked up the phone, called several people. They all came over to his house. They all sat in a circle and they all talked about that owl. And they had a long discussion about the owl, why the owl was there. And um, I thought, wow, you know, I've always believed in those kind of symbols, but to see grown men taking that very seriously was really, uh, it was an epiphany for me to understand that um, one could do that. One could take those kind of symbols seriously and contemplate them and, and ask, you know, for some guidance about them. And so to this day, when I go to the center and I am not listening to Mayor Baba's words, he comes to me as a gray horned owl. Mm. He knows that freaks me out and he knows I will stop whatever I'm doing. It does not matter what I'm doing. I will absolutely stop and I will listen. And um, so I love the way he uses you know, whatever he has to get our attention. <laughs> but that was a big Baba speaks your language, even though it's um, yes. scary. He speaks knows your language. language. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. That's what I've told people. I've been in Al Anon forever. So I always talk to people about their higher power. And I said, Your higher power speaks to your language yes. and will reach you very specifically. And there won't be any doubt. Absolutely. You're so, you're so right about that. And I love, I love, and I love that. I really, really love that. Yeah. It's Tracy, funny. can, can you Go say ahead. his, can you say his name again? The yeah. Um, and his photographs are on my website. If you go to the website, his name is Warner, W-A-R-N-E-R, -E Warner, uh, Earth. He's, um, one of, he's still alive, which is amazing because all the elders I've phot photographed and interviewed have passed except for two. Uh, oh, sorry, except for three. One's a Hopi, one's a Winnebago, Warner Earth, and one's a Cherokee, um, Amy Walker, who um, who um, is quite fabulous. She's an herbalist um, in, Cher in Cherokee. <clears throat> and she came to Asheville um, in the spring when I showed my work at the Leaf Festival in the spring. Beautiful open air barn. She came and spoke, was so great. Um, and I think she'll be coming again to Asheville to speak. She's quite, she's quite something. This is Amy Walker. She's, um, she's like 84. And um, I, t I called her up about four months ago. I said, Amy, I want to hang Cherokee baskets from the ceiling of the um, space where I'm hanging my work. And I've got stars that I've made to talk about how all tribes believe that their point of origin is stars. Could you bring me some Cherokee baskets? She's 84 years old. She was at my house an hour and a half later. She lives an hour and a half away. Mm. That, that's Amy Walker. I mean, she, and so she had cancer about 10 years ago. And I went to see her 
um, at her house. And she lives in Bryson City, which is an hour and a half outside of Asheville in this very small, beautiful little town just outside the Cherokee Reservation. And um, she has a four acre garden. Oh, four acre oh, garden. Three oh. months after her cancer surgery, she was on her tractor working that garden. Oh my gosh. Yeah, she's incredible. Do you have some of her baskets at your home? Um, I I have one. Yeah, the rest of them are at the exhibit. Yeah. Mm. I wanted you to see my owl, Tracy. <laughs> owl, not mine. This fellow <laughs> used to be my barber. And um, this is a pen, uh, colored pencil. It's a Giclée copy of colored pencil. And uh, he's Mexican, it's not Jose. And he uh, used to like to draw. He has Parkinson's now, he can't draw anymore. But he did this owl for me, for a project I had in mind. Wow. And I told him my idea See, the owl has discovered a group of quail sleeping oh. on a full moon night, and he's descended on them. And do you know how quails sleep tail to tail in a circle, 360 degrees, with their tails together? So their faces radiate out, covering together, they view 360 degrees. So... If danger, if one bird sights danger, he flies up and all the others know it immediately from the movement and they fly also. And that's what you're seeing here. They're coming out of their donut, the birds are trying to avoid. Am I, can you see that? Can you make yeah. it out? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we can see, yeah. Can you see the moon? And yeah. That's fantastic. Isn't it? Can you see the picture? I couldn't understand. Yeah, what yeah. You yes. Oh, good, did. good. Yeah, I didn't know if it was clear. Cool. That's really, that's really great. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, Ralph raises quail. No, I didn't know that. Oh. Yeah. Uh, that was funny. one of my one of my impetus to get the the that done. So he did it for him. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Did you find a basket? I did, yeah. Here it is. Oh, lovely. Yeah, it's a Cherokee uh, oak split oak basket. So it's all the, it's all hand split oak. And the dyes that they use for this um, are walnut dye for the dark brown. This is all natural oak, this lighter brown. And I forget what the red is dyed with, but these are all natural dyes that they use. And one of the last remaining prolific basket makers just died a couple of years ago. I have several of these baskets. This is Amy's, but I have several um, that are mine as well. And um, I love them. And I, I have one that's about a third the size and I used it as my pocketbook for years. And... <laughs> You, it's you, it's it is there is no dent on it there's no nothing coming apart on it, it they are rock solid these baskets mm. um and i just love them so much and people are still making baskets in the they're same not, tradition they're not made as often as they used to because a lot of the women who were older were really making them and teaching the younger women how to make them I think only women make those baskets. I've never heard of a man in Cherokee making baskets. You know, they have um, some pretty straight rules about stuff like that. So for example, women are not allowed to play drums in uh, the native tradition of, of any of any tribe. It's really frowned upon um, because of, of their menstrual cycle, actually. It's not, it's believed that if you are on your menses, you are not allowed to speak, to touch a drum. So, um, but women have been to find that. And so there are several women uh, drum groups out there today, um, which is a big deal for them to, you know, change that tradition. Mm -hmm. um, but I've never heard of a man making the baskets. 
I'm actually worried about the baskets down at that art center. I've been thinking about taking them down. I'm so worried someone might steal one. Um, and she was so kind to let me borrow them. Um, yeah, she's amazing. So many amazing people that I've met um, that are Native. Um, and I'm so grateful that I was asked to do that work because um, believe me, it did not come from me. Like I never in a million years would I have thought, oh, I think I'll go photograph some Native people, interview them. No, <laughs> just no. <laughs> because I'm, I was from the South and I didn't know any Native people. I had never met any Native people my whole life until, you know, I was asked to do this work. And then I was just terrified that I wasn't the right person to do it, you know, because I didn't know any Native people. Um, but I remember one day confessing to one of the elders that I felt very um, confused about why I was asked to do it. And, and um, you know, sort of just talking it out with him. And he said, well, he said, he said the same thing that he said the same message that I got when I was in the monastery, which is never to question, never to question mm. who you are, never to question who you are, because there's a reason for it. And you might not know what that reason is, but you're made that way for a, a very like, that's not a mistake. And so it was so good to hear that again. And then he said to me, you know, if you were a Navajo, you would have had a prejudice against the Hopis. And if you were the Crow, you wouldn't have liked the Lakotas. And um, you know, we kind of made this list of some feuding tribes, which is true. There are feuding tribes to this day. The Eastern band doesn't like the Western band of the Cherokees and vice versa. Um, and he said, you know, you come in really with an empty palate. So I was so grateful for that. Um, and what's really funny about this, since we are all Baba lovers and believe in reincarnation is that I cannot tell you how many times I've been out on the reservation and people would say, sister, what nation are you from? And I'd, I'd be like looking around going, oh, are there people from Europe here? And I'd say, oh, I'm from the Teutonic nation. And he was like, oh, never, never heard, whereabouts for your people? You know, I was like, we, we live across the great water. I'm German, 100% German by blood. And he would be like, he wouldn't say anything, but you could see on his face, he was completely confused. And then I had all these lovely elder native women like pull me aside, you know, like pull me aside. <laughs> You're native <laughs> parents haven't told you you're adopted you know and it was really it was truly confusing <laughs> because i remember as a kid like talking to god and saying listen i know you're busy like i'm just a kid but these people that i live with are not my people and you have got to come get me and take me to my people because these ain't it and um so it was very confusing for him to say those, those ladies to say those things to me because I was like, oh my God, this so explains why I didn't feel my family was really my family. <laughs> <laughs> so you're all the Indians instead of just one. Um, yeah, and, you know, it. That, you, that you're, you come in with no prejudice. You're every yeah, that's a good way to look at it. I did. I will, tell you, I will tell you that I had to work through some of the white guilt. Like was that was a hard thing for me um, is I, I did feel guilty about, you know, the way our people have treated Native people. And um, I remember um, one day somebody really trying to, you know, pin it on me in front of a whole bunch of people. And I just sat there and cried because, I mean, there was nothing else I could do. And um, the rest of the family waited until this one woman tried to pin the whole thing on me and um they said you know she does this to everybody don't take it personally it's um it's not about you and i realized at some point in time i realized that i had to um that i couldn't do the work i was asked to do if i felt guilty because it put me in a less than position with the people that i was interviewing and photographing and they could feel that and that was not a good place to be coming from. And then I had this really incredible experience where when I left Warner Earth's house, I my, my then, I had a close friend who, who drove out to drive me back home. I had flown out and he was gonna drive me back. And we just didn't wanna leave. We just felt so at home there on the Winnebago reservation. So before, so we said our goodbyes and then there was a cemetery very close by where the Winnebago's were buried with some Lakotas because Winnebago are Plains people. And we, um, we just sat there in the cemetery and rested before our trip. 
and uh, he read a book and I fell asleep. And so then we got in the car to drive home. And as it turns out, there was this huge flooding happening and we could not get over the Mississippi River. So um, we couldn't find a hotel. And that's what it was. We couldn't find a hotel. And so we had to keep driving. So by the time we found a hotel to stay in, we had been driving for like, you know, 16 hours. We were completely exhausted. So we go into the hotel, we go to sleep. This is a person to whom I was engaged at the time. And um, I wake up in the, in the middle of the night and I look next to me and instead of my fiance, his name was Denton, instead of my fiance being there, it was some Native American man. Of course, I freaked out and threw my entire body out of the bed. And he woke up and he said, oh my God, what's happening? And I said to him, I was dreaming that I was a Lakota and that the crows were coming to take my land and my child. And you and I were married, but you were a native man. So much so that I thought I woke up next to a native man, which really freaked me out. And he goes, oh, well, that happened in real life. You know, the crows became guides for the, for the whites and because the crows and the Lakotas were mortal enemies. So the crows led white people into the encampment of the Lakotas. And that's one of the reasons the Lakotas lost, you know, some of their, their battles was because of the crows. And so for about two weeks, every white person that I encountered, and I'm a white person, every white person that I encountered, I hated with the most deep and abiding passion you can possibly imagine. Like we went to Shoney's for lunch and I just looked at all those people stuffing that food in their mouths. And I just, all I could see was, you know, greed and unconsciousness. And I hated them because I was remembering being a native person. I was remembering dying at the hands of white people. And that's when I said, okay, you, you cannot live with this hate <laughs> to your own people. And you cannot live with this guilt about your own people. You have to work through this. So you cannot do, you know, you just, it's, it's unhealthy. So it was a great, it was a great lesson for me to um, realize that, um, you know, we've been all those things. And so there's really no point in feeling the guilt and there's no point in feeling the hate because we've been all those things. So it was, for me, it was very helpful, you know, around all races now. Super helpful. Mm. This is fascinating. Okay. Yeah, well, I, is every poetry session like this, Tracy? <laughs> <laughs> we do tend to go on, I will say. We do tend to, Diana, we do tend to talk until 8.30 or quarter to nine or <laughs> till somebody comes on for Artie and then they kick us off. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, and as a matter of fact, Artie is going to start in a few minutes and I think it's time for us to close. Yeah, I think so. Too. Yeah. Oh, this has just thank been you. a wonderful almost two hours and thank oh, you. Oh, goodness. My goodness, it's been wonderful. And Betty, Betty, will you start the video for me? I uh, yeah, yeah, okay. I'll go do it now. Just okay. a second. I want to make, okay. Anyway, Jay Baba. Jay Baba.